In the rivers of the west coast of North America lives one of the world's most interesting migrants. Braving difficulties of every sort, the salmon traverses rivers and seas. The life of a salmon begins when its mother lays her eggs in a stream. The first food of the young salmon is the special nutrient sac in the egg. A few weeks later, they are big enough to find food for themselves in the stream. As they continue to grow, they spend about a year in the stream. Salmon have been created with a system that allows them to live both in fresh and salt water. The reason for this is hidden in the miraculous journey that the salmon will make. On a spring morning, thousands of salmon begin to migrate down the river. The place where they will arrive weeks later is the magnificent Pacific Ocean. As soon as they arrive at the ocean, a genetic mechanism in the salmon causes a change in the makeup of their bodies, enabling them to live in salt water. In the next one to four years, they will traverse the ocean. Leaving the American coast, they will pass by Alaska, continue in a great arc in the direction of Japan, and return again. At the end of their journey, they are mature and ready for the final and most difficult journey of their lives. They will return to their home, that is, to the stream where they were born. Now they begin to travel upstream in exactly the opposite direction to the one they traveled years earlier to reach the sea. No obstacle daunts them. They can jump high enough to scale waterfalls. They can even jump three meters out of the water to climb over obstacles in their way. Sometimes they doggedly pursue their journey for distances reaching 3,200 kilometers. In the course of this journey, they eat nothing, using energy stored while they were in the ocean. Finally, those who survive, without fail, reach the river where they were born years earlier, and there lay their eggs. They have done their duty, and a short time later, they die. This journey of the salmon is one of the most amazing phenomena in nature. How is it that after thousands of salmon live for years in the sea, they can find the very stream in which they were born? In order to achieve this, they must find their own stream from among the thousands that flow into the Pacific Ocean. Then, they must swim up this stream without becoming lost. Despite the fact that the stream separates into several branches in its course, the salmon must make the right decision at each fork in the stream and continue in the right direction. The salmon succeed in this seemingly impossible venture. 
How do they succeed and why? First, let's consider the answer to the question, why? Research has shown that salmon have been created with a special sensory system to enable them to make this journey. They have been created with a natural compass that lets them find their way in the ocean by sensing the Earth's magnetic field. Thanks to this, they are able to find their direction in the vast ocean without error. But the basic question is this, how do salmon find the very streams in which they were born? For this, something else, a different system, apart from its natural compass, is required. Research has shown that salmon are created with a very delicate sense of smell and that they can find the stream in which they were born by following its smell. We would not guess that a stream has its own smell, but it is true. Every stream in the world has its own chemical composition. Most frequently, the differences between the different chemical compositions are almost too small to be detected by any creature, except the salmon. One of the most interesting occurrences which demonstrated the salmon's ability to find its direction happened in the Prairie Creek Fish Farm in Northern California. A discovery made at this farm revealed an incredible adventure of migration. On the 2nd of December, 1964, in one of the breeding pools, a two-year-old salmon was found swimming with the other young salmon. On the back fin of the salmon, were the remains of a special metal tag belonging to the Prairie Creek Fish Farm. This showed that this salmon was one of those that had been grown two years earlier in this farm and later released into the ocean. But how could this salmon have returned from the ocean and got into the farm's covered pool? There is a clue to how this could have happened. There was a box covered with a metal grill that opened into the overflow channel of one of the pools. The cover was broken. Could the salmon have entered this channel in its attempt to get back to the place of its birth, broken the cover, and entered the pool? There is no other explanation for the occurrence. But it seems impossible when you consider the distance the salmon had to go from the ocean to this pool. In order for the salmon to get back to the farm where it was born, it had to begin its journey from this point, that is, from the point where the Redwood Creek flowed into the ocean. Later, the salmon would swim five kilometers against the current and come to the first fork in the river. At this fork, it would make the right decision and go to the north, but further on, there would be an even more difficult branching. Here, the salmon would receive two very similar signals. The farm where the salmon was born was located right in the middle of this branch. The first choice for the salmon would have been to go to the right because the water flowing from it came from that direction. But for some reason, it chose to go to the left and began to approach the farm from behind. The reason for this surprising decision was to be found under the highway that passed through the area. Under the highway, there was a channel that collected the water that overflowed from the fish farm. Most of the time, very little water flowed through this channel, and leaves absorbed it before it reached the river. But 
But this year there had been a lot of rain, and as a result, the water in the channel was able to reach the river. This weak current was enough to guide the salmon. It must have recognized the smell, followed it from the river, and made its way through the overflow channel, having to swim and crawl its way through the five to 10 centimeters deep water. And later, it had to find its way in a confusing system of water pipes in the channel. And even if it succeeded in getting that far, it would still have been stopped at the cover. It must have been squeezed in the concrete channel located inside this wooden track. But the salmon did not give up. It found the pipe, 12 centimeters in diameter, which connected this channel to the pool. It made its way through this pipe and finally came to its last obstacle. It overcame this obstacle by hitting its head against it with great force. So, at the end of this incredible journey, the salmon reached the little pool where it was born two years earlier. When officials of the fish farm realized what had happened, they wondered whether there were other salmon that had returned to their places of birth. In order to see what they might find, they took up the wooden planks and looked in the channel underneath. To their amazement, they found a total of 70 salmon, each with a tag from the fish farm. This extraordinary story of the salmon gives us an important proof of the creation. We can see that every stage of the journey made by the salmon was calculated. It is by itself a great wonder that there is a program that directs the salmon to return years later to the river in which it was born. Besides this, it is certainly not by chance that the salmon possesses a natural compass that allows it to find its way in the ocean, or that it has the most sensitive sense of smell in the world. All this shows that the salmon is a creature specially created for the migration decreed for it. The one who created the salmon with all its extraordinary capabilities is Allah, the creator of all living things and the Lord of all the worlds. One of the most interesting creatures in nature is the honeybee, which offers us a perfect feast with the honey it produces.
Honeybees live in colonies in hives they construct with great care. Inside each hive, there are thousands of small hexagonal combs made to store the honey. In order to fill these combs with honey, the bees have to collect nectar from flowers. This is indeed a painstaking task. The latest scientific research has revealed that in order to produce half a kilo of honey, the bees must visit about four million individual flowers. Finding these flowers is in itself a difficult job. For this, the bees appoint some scouts and foragers from among their number. How do forager bees find the way to flowers in tracts of land that are vast compared to their own size? How do they find their way back to the hive without getting lost? How do they explain to the other bees the way to the source of the flowers? When we examine these questions, we come up with some very interesting facts. On the screen you see a bee that has discovered a source of flowers. The job of this forager bee is to return to the hive and inform the other bees of the place where it found the flowers. As soon as the forager bee returns to its hive, it starts to describe the location of the flower source it has discovered to the other bees. First, it lets the other bees taste a small bit of the nectar it has collected from the flowers, which gives them information about its quality. Then it begins its main task, describing the direction to the flowers. It does this in a very interesting way, by dancing. The forager begins to dance in the middle of the hive by shaking its body. It is difficult to believe, but in the course of this dance, the shaking will give the other bees all the information about where the flowers are located. For example, if the dance is in straight lines towards the upper part of the hive, the source of nutrients is exactly in the direction of the sun. If the flowers are located in the opposite direction, the bee makes lines in that direction. Look, now the bee is dancing towards the right. This shows that the flower source is exactly 90 degrees to the right. And this forager bee is explaining to his nestmates a 45 degree inclination to the left of the sun. But there is a question. The bees explain the direction according to the position of the sun, but the sun is continually moving. Every four minutes the sun moves one degree towards the west, which would lead one to expect that the bees would make an error. However, observations have shown that the bees take account of the sun's movement. As the forager bees give directions, every four minutes the angle they describe moves one degree to the west. Thanks to this marvelous calculation, the bees never lose their way. The forager bees not only give information about the direction of the flowers, but also the distance to them. The duration of the dance and the number of vibrations let the other bees know the exact distance. They store just enough nutrients for this distance and then set out on the journey. This wonderful specialization of bees was tested in an experiment done in California. In this experiment, three containers of sugar water were placed in three different locations. Shortly afterwards, forager bees discovered these sources. The forager bees that came to the first container were marked with a dot. Those who came to the second container were marked with a line. 
and those who came to the third container were marked with a plus sign. Minutes later, bees in the hive were observed carefully watching these forager bees. Scientists also marked with a dot those bees watching forager bees marked with a dot and likewise they marked other bees with the same signs as those of the forager bees they were watching. Some minutes later, bees marked with a dot arrived at the first container, bees marked with a line arrived at the second container, and those marked with a plus sign came to the third container. So it was proved that the bees in the hive found their direction according to information related by the forager bees. All these facts should be carefully considered. Where did the bees get their amazing organization? How can a small insect that does not have the faculty of thought or intellect act as a forager? How can it think to search out sources of nutrients and inform its nestmates of them? Even if it thought about it, how could it develop a dance technique to inform the others where the source was located and the distance to it? How can bees in the hive understand the meaning of the complicated movements and vibrations of the messenger bees? Darwin's theory of evolution, which claims that life on Earth came about by chance, has no answer to these questions. Each of these special qualities of bees shows that their creator gave them to them. Allah created them and inspired them to do their work. This fact is in the Quran. Your Lord inspired the bees. Make hives in the mountains and in the trees and in what they build. Then eat of all the fruits and walk in the ways of your Lord submissively. There comes forth from within it a beverage of many colors in which there is a healing for men. Most surely there is a sign in this for people who reflect. There is a remarkable kind of butterfly that lives in southern Canada. The famous monarch butterfly. Every monarch, like every other butterfly, comes into the world after having gone through a perfectly designed series of changes. First, the mother butterfly deposits her eggs on a leaf. The larvae that hatch feed for a time on the leaves before becoming caterpillars. Later, they make a nest called a cocoon for themselves. The cocoon of a monarch butterfly is a wonder of design. 
It is attached to a branch of a tree with a very slender but strong thread. The caterpillar develops in this cocoon and gradually emerges as a wonderful new creature, a butterfly. At first its wings are flat and lifeless. But they expand as blood is pumped into them and the monarch is ready to fly. There is a very interesting piece of behavior that distinguishes monarchs from other species of butterfly. In the course of a year, four different generations of monarchs are produced. The first three generations have an average lifespan of about five to six weeks. But the fourth generation is very different. This generation will survive until it has completed an eight-month migration. The migration begins from various monarch centers in southern Canada and moves further south. One group goes to California and another group even further south to Mexico. It is interesting that all the monarchs meet each other on the way, as if they had received a command from one single center and continue together on the migration. The beginning of the monarch's migration has also been planned from one single center. They do not start out on their journey on just any day, but on that one day in the autumn, the autumnal equinox, when day and night are the same duration. After flying for two months, they reach the hot forests of the south. Millions of monarchs cover the trees like a tissue, and for four months, from December to March, they stay there eating nothing. They survive on fat stored in their bodies and only drinking water. The blossoming of the flowers in the spring is very important for the monarchs. After waiting for four months, they feast on nectar. Now they have stored the energy they will need to return to Northern America. At the end of March, before beginning their journey, they mate. On that day, the spring equinox, when day and night are of equal duration, the colony begins its flight north. At the end of their journey, they reach Canada and die shortly afterwards. But before they die, they give birth to the first generation of the year, which will survive for about one and a half months. Later, the second and third generations are succeeded by the fourth, which will once again begin the migration. This generation will again live six months longer than the others, and thus the chain continues. This amazing migration brings many questions to mind. How is it that each fourth generation is born so as to live six months longer than the others? How does this long-lived generation always coincide with the winter months? How do the butterflies always begin their migration on that day when night and day are of equal length? And how are they able to make that delicate calculation? How does the new generation of monarchs that has never before gone on a migratory flight know the way? All this demonstrates that monarchs have been created with a perfect migration plan and that they follow this plan to the letter. If there were an error in this plan, 
they would not be able to complete the migration. In that case, all the monarchs would have died in the winter and the monarch species would have become extinct. It is clear that these creatures have been created with this particular quality and that this extraordinary annual migration has been inspired in them. It is Allah, the Lord of the heavens and the earth, the creator and ruler of all beings, who is the author of this wondrous creation. Human beings have experimented with many ways to fly. Since the first aeroplane was built about 100 years ago, thousands of different models of aeroplane have been developed. Countless numbers of scientists have tried to make better flight machines until finally they built today's flying machines with their wonderful designs. Flying is a great ability, but its usefulness depends on how well it is controlled. Actually, to be able to remain hovering in the air or to be able to land where you want are at least as important as flight. For this reason, human beings have developed an aircraft with a high degree of maneuverability. The helicopter. Helicopters can hover in mid-air and take off vertically. Especially because of their military advantages, nations have devoted unlimited budgets towards helicopter design. But recent research has come up with a very amazing fact. Modern helicopter flight technology is quite primitive compared to that of a very small, animate flying creature. This living flying creature is the dragonfly. The flying system of the dragonfly is a wonder of design, surpassing in flight technology all the machines created by human beings. For this reason, the design of the latest model of the world-famous Sikorsky helicopter was produced using the design of the Dragonfly as a model. In this project, an IBM firm assisted in the design of the Sikorsky by loading images of a Dragonfly in a special computer. Afterwards, taking the example of the Dragonfly, thousands of illustrations were made on the computer. Then, with the example of the flight technology of the Dragonfly, the Sikorsky model was produced. In short, the body of a small insect contains a design superior to one planned by human beings. Light technology of the dragonfly and the design of its wings demonstrate a fact. This little creature shows us the wondrous design in the artistry of Allah. The dragonfly has two sets of wings placed diagonally on its body, allowing it to maneuver very quickly. Dragonflies can reach a speed of 50 kilometers an hour in a very short time, which is very surprising for an insect. An Olympic athlete in a 100 meter race runs only 39 kilometers an hour.
There is one other condition of good flight. Flight is very dangerous if it is not supported by a very good visual system. For this reason, modern airplanes and helicopters have an advanced visual system. The Dragonfly 2 has a highly advanced visual system. It has a total of 30,000 micro eyes, and every eye is directed towards a different point. All information from these eyes is transmitted to the Dragonfly's brain, which processes it like a computer. Thanks to this system, the Dragonfly has marvelous visual ability. As for the maneuverability of the Dragonfly, it is more developed than that of a helicopter. For example, with a last-minute maneuver, it saves itself from a truck coming from the opposite direction. Now the Dragonfly must contend with a double trap. It must avoid striking the windshields of the oncoming automobile, and it must escape the rapacious birds that hunt it. And it succeeds in this with a very clever maneuver. One of the problems pilots face, who often have to maneuver, is that after a maneuver, it is difficult to determine the position of the craft relative to the ground. After the maneuver, if the pilot is confused about which side of the plane is up and which is down, the aircraft may crash. Technicians have developed an instrument to counter this risk, the gyroscope. This instrument shows the pilot a horizontal line indicating the horizon. The pilot compares the horizontal line with the actual horizon and is able to determine the plane's position in an instant. For millions of years, the Dragonfly has been using a device similar to the one developed by technicians. Before the Dragonfly's eyes, there is fixed an artificial horizontal line. No matter at what angle it flies, it always holds its head parallel to the horizontal line. When the Dragonfly's body changes its position during flight, hairs between its body and its head are stimulated. The nerve cells at the root of these hairs send information to the Dragonfly's flight muscles about the insect's position in the air. Thanks to this, the flying muscles automatically adjust the number and speed of the wing movements. So, in even the most difficult maneuvers, the Dragonfly never loses its direction or its control. This system is indeed a wonder of engineering. At this point, an intelligent person will start to think. The Dragonfly is not even aware of the extraordinary system it possesses. Who placed in the body of this insect such complex flight systems that even expert engineers have taken them as models? Who endowed this insect with its perfect wings, the motors that drive the wings and the superior visual system? Who is the author of this excellent design? The Darwinist's theory of evolution, which tries to account for life by coincidences, is silent when confronted with these questions. It is impossible that the system in the body of the dragonfly could have come about by evolution, that is, in a stage-by-stage -stage development through chance. The reason for this is that for a living thing to survive, all these systems must exist at the same time and completely. The first dragonfly in the world must have appeared with the same wonderful mechanisms possessed by these same insects today. The fossil record of natural history confirms this. The fossil record shows that dragonflies appeared on Earth all at once. The earliest known fossil of a dragonfly is 320 million years old. In the fossil strata of earlier periods, there is nothing that resembles a dragonfly.
Moreover, since the time the dragonfly appeared, the fossil record shows that it has undergone no evolution. The oldest fossils of dragonflies are completely the same as those same insects living today. Between the 140 million year old fossil that you are looking at and the present day dragonfly beside it, there is no difference at all. These facts once again prove the invalidity of the theory of evolution and shows how both the dragonfly and all other living things in the world came to be. Allah, the Lord of all the worlds, created all living creatures, and every living thing is a proof of his existence. Apart from Allah, there is no other power strong enough to create even a fly. This fact is revealed by Allah in the Quran in these words. Mankind, an example has been made, so listen to it carefully. Those whom you call upon besides Allah are not even able to create a single fly, even if they were to join together to do it. And if a fly steals something from them, they cannot get it back. How feeble are both the seeker and the sought. The creatures we have examined throughout this film are only a few of the wonders of creation found in nature. In truth, Allah endows all living things in nature with their wonderful peculiarities, and each one is a proof that shows Allah's artistry and power. It is important to be able to see this wonderful creation in nature and to grasp its purpose. Allah wants us to think about creation and to draw conclusions from it. In a verse of the Quran, Allah says, Say, travel about the earth and see how he brought creation out of nothing. Then later, Allah will bring about the next existence. Allah has power over all things. This film is based on Harun Yahya's book, 